really, really excited to have in the studio for the, for the hour, uh, Maureen Boyle, formerly of the New Bedford Standard Times, now uh, at, the, at Stonehill College uh, in Easton, to discuss her groundbreaking book, Shallow Graves, The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. Uh, the, the Only the second book written on this, and really yes. the latest. The other book was written, I think, 20 years ago or something. Yeah. At least 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing uh, today? I'm really, really glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. It's, I know sometimes it's difficult on Sundays, but our audience has been really looking forward to this. We've been talking about it for, for a little while since you and I arranged this. Uh, and I read the book, and I, I can't say enough how I know I texted you halfway through it, so yeah. this is a masterpiece, <laughs> because it really is um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think um, you've known this story. You helped develop this story. You, you, you wrote, well, tell us, you wrote basically the first story on this, or yes, one of the first. Yes, one of the first stories. Uh, when the, excuse me, when uh, the case first started, it st- emerged very, very slowly, Uh Two bodies were found along the highway, one in uh, Freetown, one in uh, Dartmouth. No one really saw any links in it. Uh, It wasn't until the third body that was uh, discovered that investigators started to see some some type of uh, connection to them. Um, However, prior to that, uh, I was uh, talking to a lot of the women who were working the streets, the prostitutes Mm -hmm. who were working the streets, and they, in about two years prior to that, they were talking about... uh, individuals who were attacking women, who were assaulting them, uh, who were choking them. Uh, so attacks on uh, women who were drug addicted at the time, were, that was on my radar at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, after the bodies were found, uh, it came to my attention that there were a number of women who were reported missing by their families. And it, it sort of snowballed mm-hmm. after that. What, what I found interesting in the book, and I know of course, I grew up with this story. I was a high school kid at the time. They were finding bodies in Freetown, which is where I grew up. Uh, and of course, it was everything. I was a paper boy, so I was delivering the paper and reading it. It was an afternoon paper back then. Yes. And since I've gotten to know a lot of the people uh, involved in the case on the police side and prosecution side, I found it interesting, and you, you developed this in, in the book, is the amount of people who are, vis- who are picking up these 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 women that it wasn't just the people you think pick up prostitutes that it was all kinds of people you don't name them but yeah it, it, I was really uh, shocked at the number of men that were picking up uh, the prostitutes well at the time uh, there was a sense in certain circles in the community that somehow uh, the women brought this upon themselves that it's their fault uh, and the whole area of who was preying on the women seemed to be lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, right. it, in all of it, uh, the, the the men that were picking them up were businessmen, uh, doctors, lawyers, dentists, dentists uh, people involved in law enforcement, people that were in the federal law enforcement, retired. Uh, it, I was absolutely shocked at the names that I was hearing. Um, yeah, and, and and people, you know, like what were they thinking? This was a t- uh, the time when AIDS was a Big issue in the community, intravenous drug use and the spread of AIDS on the front page of uh, papers, uh, on TV. And these men were really, I consider them, preying on women who are out there just to feed their drug habit. We're we're speaking with Maureen Boyle, who's the author of Shallow Graves, The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. There's a scene in your book uh, with Bob St. Jean, who people around here probably know as the former, he was a state trooper, but he was also a selectman in, uh, in a cushionet later on. Where people, people, prominent people in the community are calling him, asking if they're being investigated. Yes. And yes. he says, he, and he was amazed. Uh, he told me he was absolutely amazed. He's, he's, you know, putting down the phone, going like, "Are these people crazy in this day and age?" And they are going out and picking up women on the street that they don't know. Right. It it makes no sense at all. Folks, you have to pick up this book because the cast of characters is really, really amazing. I want to go through some of the people who started. This. You mentioned you're speaking with a New Bedford police officer who really got the first theory that, hey, something might be going on here. And that was uh, that John. Was, that was John Dextrader. He um, was a New Bedford detective, uh, very by-the-book uh, individual. Uh, and he, early on, about uh, one to two years prior to this, uh, there had been a s- several murders of women who had been le- leaving bars. Uh, he found it very, very unusual because there were no suspects. 
And that's very unusual in a small community, small city like New Bedford. Even cases that were not solved at the time, the police knew who did it. Mm-hmm. And in this one, it was, in these cases, it seemed there was no one. Yeah, they call them un- uncharged but not unsolved. Yes, exactly. Right. But in this case, no. In, 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 in se- several of those earlier cases, they did not know uh, who d- committed the murders. So then it gets elo- so so uh, detective. No, 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 the, yeah. the, the names of those that would be Joanne Andrade, still right. un- unsolved. Uh, Shirley Parton, uh, the, still unsolved. Uh, Dorothy Danielson, still unsolved. So so, so Maureen, then t- 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 if I'm remembering this correctly, Dextra, uh, Detective Dextrada goes to the DA's office. Yes, um, he was very very bothered by uh, the number of. Uh, he, he was. He noticed a pattern of women who were going missing, reported missing in the city. Uh, they seemed to. Th- they had uh, similarities, same height, same weight for the most part, mm-hmm. uh, and all of them had uh, drug problems. So he went to the DA's office to say, you know, something isn't right. You have. A uh, two bodies that were found along the highway. Could it be them? We've got these missing women here. Uh, maybe a task force is needed. We've had attacks on uh, women earlier in the earlier years. Could they all be related? There's been some cases in Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he went to the DA's office, talked to uh, Bob St. Jean and uh, other people, and they eventually got things rolling. And again, folks, you have to. You should read the book *Shallow Graves*. We're not going to tell all the story here because we want you to go out and get the book. Yeah. And and we couldn't do it justice here, truthfully, yeah. because I, I found one thing that's really good, great about the structure of this book is that you have a, a timeline in it. So as you're reading, it, you can click back and forth, yeah. and really, really, it, it, it it's very user friendly. Um, and you have a great story there. We won't tell it here about John and his son Chris, yeah. who later becomes a New Bedford cop, and and yeah. their sort of interaction on this, and then. What they see is they're driving down the highway one day, but we'll leave that for the for the people who want to read who can read the book. Josie Gonzalez talked about him. Yes, uh, Josie, uh, very community minded uh, state trooper, very good investigator. He and Marianne Dill, also another trooper, uh, they were working together on the investigation. Spent hours upon hours, along with other troopers and other uh, local police uh, detectives interviewing such a wide range of individuals, talking to uh, women, talking to men uh, who are, were drug addicts, mm-hmm. uh, because they were fami- familiar and could see things on, uh, on the streets, uh, interviewing people who were renting videotapes, people who were producing uh, videos. Because adult videos. Adult videos. Right. Because there had been some rumors that uh, were there snuff films involved. So they tracked down every conceivable place that would have a uh, homemade and nasty um, adult video. And there was an in- there may or may not have been an industry here in this area yeah, the, doing the, that. Yeah, that had been uh, long rumored. Right. So they, and of course, once they get these videos, they have to watch them, and they were very, very badly made. Right. Not exciting, <laughs> <laughs> as they I said. <laughs> but, but the, the two of them, along with Richie Ferreira from New Bedford PD, and a number of other uh, state troopers and local uh, police uh, officers, really put in an awful lot of time in the case that people were not aware of. Even though I knew a lot about the case, mm-hmm. um, once I started digging even more, uh, looking at police reports and court records, I mean, I, I reviewed thousands upon thousands of pages, and I was stunned at the work that went into this case that the public was not aware of. You do a, a very nice job explaining that, I, I, particularly particularly through through the vehicle of, of the three detectives, uh, Dill, uh, Gonzalez, and... Uh, and Richie and Ferrer. Richie Ferrer. Uh, who doesn't live that far from here. Oh, <laughs> well, that's... Everyone's, everyone is still local. Everyone is still around. Because I grew up with Josie Gonzalez's kids, and that scene where he has to bring the videotapes home, I'm sort of laughing to yeah. myself. He waits for the kids to go to bed. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, he's down there watching these, these grainy ad- adult yes. films. Anyway, it's really... It's, it's and, and, you know, the toll that the investigation took on the investigators uh, was really quite immense, because mm-hmm. uh, Josie Gonzalez is very much um, a family man. R- yes. Uh, and really enjoys... Uh, enjoyed spending time with his children when they were young, coaching. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he still does uh, coaching and works with uh, the boys' club. 
And his son's a police officer now in New yes. Bedford. Yeah. Uh, so he, uh, it was very, very difficult that uh, for him being away from his family and uh, doing the investigation. Just driving and, around the, the, the worst sections and talking to really damaged people. Yeah. Hour after hour. Yeah. But you know what? You know, people always describe certain parts of the city as the worst sections. Right. I have never in New Bedford in all my years uh, found any place that would be called the worst section. There's, you know, there's neighborhoods that may be a little bit run down. Yeah. But I have never, ever been afraid to go anywhere in, totally the, agree in the city. Totally agree with you. It, it's I think one of the nicest uh, hidden gems, and let's not tell anyone about it. <laughs> well, I, truthfully, and, and also you end the book in a very positive note, which, which again, when you when you read it, you'll see how that all ties in together. Uh, what do we do? So we'll take a quick break. We're speaking with Maureen Boyle, who's the author of Shallow Graves, The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. When we get back, we'll continue discussing the case and the, and the law enforcement personalities that are involved. Well, then we'll get into the lawyers, and of course, we're going to get into the victims as well. But we'll be right back. Good morning. We're back here live on Sunday Brunch with Maureen Boyle, who's the host of Shallow Graves, the hunt for the New Bedford Highway serial killer. Now, this isn't yet in bookstores, but it can be pre-ordered, right? Yes, it can be pre-ordered through Amazon, um, Barnes & Noble, and the publisher, which is University Press of New England. So people can go out and order it, and it'll be available next month? Next week. Next it it week. comes comes out September 5th. So even your local bookstores, you can um, contact them and say, uh, I want this, and they'll make sure that, that they have If there were any local it. bookstores left. Well, there is. There's is there? a Partners yeah. Village in Westport. Oh. All right. Um, and if there's any other local <laughs> right. bookstores out there, uh, l- let me know. Believe me, I'm a book hound, and yeah. I, I, they're, they're almost all gone. Um, are you doing a book signing coming up? Yes, uh, at the Country Club of New Bedford. Uh, that will be on September 7th. Uh, Partners is going to be selling books there, okay. uh, and that will be at 4.30. Okay. I'll be talking and signing books. Excellent, excellent. So let's get back to the case. So so you the, of the detectives that were involved in this, one of the fascinating ones that I thought was the technology aspect of it, and you had Lou Pacheco. Yes. Ta- talk Lou a little bit pa- about the technology. Yeah, yeah Lou Pacheco uh, at the time prior to that was uh, working in Rainham uh, PD. He joined the Bristol County uh, Drug Task Force and was in charge of the Drug Task Force at the time. Um, The Drug Task Force, for those who weren't around at that point, was a a group of local police departments. They pulled the resources uh, to track drug trafficking in the area Uh, because, of course, drug dealers do not know town borders. Right. but he was, for his time, and he still is, uh, he was a computer whiz. Mm-hmm. And no one at the time knew anything about computers, right. except that they're there and please help me turn them on. Right. Uh, in 1988, remember, there was no Twitter. There no. was no Facebook. Uh, people did not have cell phones. Uh, there weren't surveillance cameras, except in the banks. And the quality of the surveillance cameras there were pretty bad. Right. Uh, so he tried to develop a uh, database, an electronic database, computerized database of all of the information, uh, which was very, very unique at the time. Today, you know, it's simple. Right. Uh, then uh, he, he was basically reinventing inventing, um, a type of database. It, yeah, and if, particularly if you're interested in forensics and things like that, this book is another must read because you basically te- show a little bit of the history of forensics or, or what was, what nothing existed back yeah, then. Even yeah, fingerprinting yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, today people will say, and I'm sure some of your callers will say, well, they didn't, why didn't they check for DNA? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they touch, t- touch for, test for, uh, touch DNA? It w- didn't exist right. at the time. It wasn't accepted by the courts and it didn't exist. At that time, uh, DNA uh, samples needed to be fairly large for testing, and the samples often would be destroyed in the testing. Uh, that even for fingerprints, um, you did not have the same fingerprint database right. uh, that you have today, which is one of the reasons why there was such a delay in identifying a number of the women. It is, it is a fascinating history of because it was on the cusp of technology. Yes. Had, had these killings been done a couple of years later, who knows? Um, if those killings had been done today, I think the, the killer would have been caught uh, 
maybe within a month. Mm -hmm. You describe a scene where they go into Alfie's place, which is now gone. Yeah. Where they're looking for a missing woman, and they're talking to these people. And of course, as you, that's where you first point out that there are no video cameras. Of course, no. now if you went to that block, there's a million video cameras yes. in that little region right there. Yep. there. There were no video cameras. You you had to rely on the memories of people who were there to get their memories fogged. Yeah, and um, in that particular case, when people are uh, going, when the investigators are going to Alfie's and interviewing people, they're just it, it really highlights how bad people's memories can be. Unless you know something, there's some reason why you have to remember something. Mm -hmm. You forget it. Right, right. It's it's so. You have a story in the book of a gentleman who comes in, gentleman, to talk about his missing girlfriend. It's one of the first P Piva, yeah. and and how di uh, Nancy Piva, Nancy yes. Piva, how she disappears, and that's one of the first things that that, that John Dextrader says is why does this guy remember everything? What, well, <laughs> this was. Uh, the thing, um, John Dextrader uh, knew Nancy's boyfriend. He had he had a record, and he knew that there was absolutely no reason why he would come into the police station. No, unless he was under arrest, he wouldn't talk to cops. He would not um, flag anyone down. He wouldn't seek help. He would walk the other way if a cop approached him, and to see him at the front desk pleading with the desk officer as he tried to report his girlfriend missing. Uh, John just happened to be walking by and thought it was very, very odd, very unusual, and very, very out of character of, uh, of uh, Nancy's boyfriend, uh, whose name was Frankie. So at that point, John stopped and told the desk officer, I'll take care of this, and talk to Frankie and, you know, First, he was he thought you know Nancy's boyfriend was uh, setting up an alibi for himself, but he also knew there was something just not right about mm -hmm. this. That um, police sense, that that street yeah. cop sense, yeah. right? And, and John was a, a wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And he's passed away now. Yes, he has. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So now let's move from the from some of the police involved in this. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about uh, District Attorney Ron Peener, his mm -hmm. role in this thing. At what point does Ron Peener get? aggressively involved in this? Oh, Ron is always a very aggressive prosecutor. Um, people either loved him or hated him. Very, very bright individual. Uh, had a innate knack for being able to pick the best and the brightest for his office. Uh, because if you look at who is... Uh, who he had hired back then. Most of them are some of the top attorneys or uh, judges. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron Berry, Scott Lang, sure. Yeah, yep. they're, they're, they're absolutely wonderful. Um, so, But he was always a lightning rod. As I said, people loved him or hated him. Uh, they thought that you know he liked the media too much. He was a very nice-looking uh, guy. Uh, the cameras loved him. Literally, uh, because he came across very, very well, very well spoken, mm -hmm. very well educated. Um, so he became the face of the investigation. While the investigators were out there tracking down people, the cameras, he was the magnet uh, for the cameras. And that worked for him and against him ultimately. And of course, the time of people, again, this is what's very important here is, is that you have Mike Dukakis, who's running for president. Yep. Pe people think that Ron, the, the, the DA's office, maybe just a, he's maybe leaving very soon to become a U.S. senator, a cabinet member. Yeah, that, that, it, it seems what's interesting about Ron was that from the very start, everyone kept on saying, oh, he's going to be going on to bigger and better things because he was such a bright star. Um, so that whatever he did always seemed to be clouded in that political haze of, oh, is he doing it for political mm -hmm. reasons, even when he did it for the right reason. Sure. I mean, with the highway killings, while people said that he was doing it all, it was all politics, I have no doubt that he really, really wanted to find the killer. Not, not because it would further his political agenda, but because it was the right thing. Yeah, no, I 100% yeah. Yeah, no, agree with you on that. And, and it, for people who don't remember that time, it was a, an incredible. I mean, that was it. That was the story. And, yeah, and the, that was and, it. And the fact that I was hearing stories as a, as a high school kid meant mm -hmm. everyone else was hearing them. You know, if I was hearing the stories about, for instance, the snuff films, yes. and that's still even at the and you you don't discount really many of the theories, and you don't uh, necessarily put any of the theories forward. You lay yep. them all out for people, and they can they can make yep. their judgment. 
on them. But that theory, you say even in the end, Bob St. Jean still thought there might be something with the, there might with be the something porn there. movies. Why were you hearing this? Um, yeah. Uh, but, however, another uh, investigator from Plymouth County at the time had said, you know, I think people were mishearing, mishearing it, that it wasn't a um, snuff film. Someone was mishearing the accent, and it was a smut film. Very interesting. Very interesting. Because we're in that world, right, where it's all rumors, and, uh, yeah. and, and, and everyone's got a theory, and a lot of it's clouded by drugs and alcohol among yeah. the, the people who knew the victims um, and the victims themselves. Yeah. And, you know, at the, at the heart of every rumor, often there is a little kernel of truth, sure. and that's what the investigators always have to uh, unearth. Okay, right. Where did this rumor start and why? And who started it? Right, right. And so as this progresses, we begin to they begin to focus in on certain suspects. Yes. The most famous, of course, is is, is the attorney. Yeah, Kenny Ken, Pond. Kenny Pond. Talk a little bit about Ken Pond. Uh, Kenny Pond. Uh, who's dead now. Who's yeah, passed he's away. dead. Kenny Pond was a local attorney. He had a, um, a cocaine addiction. Uh, he, his was could have been a wonderful pull yourself up a wonderful story of recovery he had a drug problem uh, early in his life uh, overcame it uh, finished college went to law school uh, but as people today know uh, in particular heroin uh, is a very very difficult uh, addiction to overcome uh, he at one point was heav heavy into cocaine and However, he still tried very, very hard to maintain his demeanor and his, his standing in the community. He also knew if it came out that he was uh, addicted to cocaine, his law uh, practice was, was shattered. Sure. But, so he, but he, had, he, he, was, he was his own worst enemy through the entire case. Hey, t talk a little bit. So, so the, as you point out, he was he was worried is that his use of cocaine would come out. So that's what he was using a lot of these girls for. Yeah, he would have girls buy cocaine for him, and they'd come to the house, uh, and the girls would also use him also because they would use his coke. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they use up all his coke, and he would keep. But he was also also appeared to be a very very lonely man because he wouldn't let them leave. Right. He wanted them to stay around with him, and it wasn't for sex. It right. seems like it was more just for companionship. So and folks, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna tell these stories on the radio because I don't know that we can tell them anyway. First of all, it's Sunday morning, yeah. but you got to read the book because yeah. uh, it's he. They, she describes what the girls told him would happen. He'd shoot cocaine. So they would shoot cocaine into his neck, and then don't stop the carnival. Yeah, the it, sick, it, it, sick exactly. carnival. Exactly. But you have, have to read the book to yeah. hear those stories. And you know, you really do feel for the girls because they are still battling their own addiction. Um, but they want to get out of there too. Right. It was, <laughs> he was too crazy for them, for many of them. That that alone, that those stories alone, are the reason this book should be made into a movie. We're speaking with Maureen Boyle, the author of *Shallow Graves: The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer*. All right, so Ken Pont, that story is very fascinating, uh, he, and he becomes the center of Ron Peener's world in terms of the prosecution. We're going to come back to in a second, but let's talk about the other suspect, Neil Anderson. Yeah, Neil Anderson. He uh, was arrested for a series of uh, sexual assaults on women that he picked up. Uh, he was initially considered a suspect, um, and for whatever reason, was uh, they moved on mm -hmm. after him. He's still alive, I believe. He's still alive. I think he's in prison now. Yeah. Uh, the last I had heard, he was uh, locked up uh, after he robbed a bank. On a bicycle. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. Addiction makes people do very strange things. Yes. Um, my former neighbor, uh, De Grazia, yeah, in Freetown, he was one of the other big suspects. He's yes. also now deceased. Yes, he committed suicide. What uh, What was his role in in, in this or suspected um, he, role? He was uh, Tony De Grazia. Tony uh, Anthony De Grazia. He was uh, charged with uh, a series of attacks on uh, on women women he picked up in the Weld Square area. He would take them to secluded areas and grab them by the throat and try to choke them. Uh, several of them, um, as I said, he choked them out and they lost consciousness. And they, uh, those that he was charged with, uh, you know, fought back and escaped. And he later he later killed himself uh, at his former girlfriend's parents' house. Yes. Really sad story. Yeah, it is. It is. He's a, a 
he was a very very sad in, individual abused his, but, by his mother um that that was what the allegation was um that that he w- had been abused as a child um that's what came out in some of the um, divorce documents uh, however his mother still had uh, custody of him and custody of all of the kids so you know how do you know how, yeah how do you know how do you know what comes out in divorce records and what is true what is not true and um you and know, they, his mother yeah. has since passed away so yeah um, not to malign her character either, but you know who knows what what happens in a family. Right. No, that's very true. And of course, and there's a great scene again in the in the in the book, where um, where Tony, the police are looking for him, and they come to the St. John Newman Church, and of course that was my parish church growing yeah. up, uh, Josie Gonzalez Church. Yeah. Here he is going to arrest a guy at the parish house of his parish priest. Yes. It was it was it was a very uncomfortable situation for Josie because he is a devout Catholic, as were most of the the. the investigators that were there sure. at, on that night and it was kind of weird to go up and you know go to a church and talk to the priest to say oh, we need to get into your house father right. um, the guy eating spaghetti in there is, yeah uh, <laughs> might be yeah, yeah uh well he wasn't charged with murder he was uh That's th- right. that was for a sexual assault he was never charged with uh with murder That's right. so let's let's talk let's focus back now is that those are the three suspects that were named right? were named yeah there was uh, another individual who was out in missouri who was um uh talking that's a great story. T- telling people that you know he he did it just to get back to the east coast because he wanted a road trip of, that's of a great sorts story. that's in the book folks that's a that's a fantastic yeah. story we're talking with maureen boyle author of shallow graves the hunt for the new bedford highway serial killer um Ken Pond. So, so he becomes the real focus. He actually is charged. He is charged. He's charged with one of the murders, uh, with uh, the murder of a, of one of the first victims, a woman, uh, Rochelle, from uh, the Cape. She had been staying with him at one point, uh, and then she disappeared, likely sometime in April. She was never reported missing, uh, but the poli- New Bedford police uh, wanted to talk with her concerning allegations that she had been sexually assaulted by a New Bedford man uh, who denied that he uh, assaulted her. And Kenny Pont uh, went up to the guy with a gun and threatened him. So that became a a little sideshow to the whole case. Right. But that that was the first uh, clue for the investigators that maybe... Uh, Ken Kenny Pont was tied somehow to the case because he was with one of the victims uh, who disappeared. Um, she was later found dead in Dartmouth, uh, and he had a gun, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he threatened someone. And so ultimately, he's charged. And then, of course, we have an election. Paul Walsh beats Ron Pina for the district yeah, attorney. The, job. the indictment against Kenny Pont was one month before the primary, and it what really was a winner take all primary because. There was no Republican uh, running, so right. whoever won the primary uh, won the election, and Ron was uh, up against Paul Walsh, and of course Paul Walsh Jr. won. Yeah, um, and then Paul does a very interesting thing, which you, you you display in the book, that he brings in someone else to evaluate the case, mm-hmm. right? Because he looks at the case, he reads, he, he he meets he meets for hours at a time with the state troopers, he gets the entire case yes. laid out for him. And he decides what? Uh, he decides that he's going to bring in a uh, special prosecutor so that it would not be uh, political. Because mm-hmm. no matter what he did, uh, it would be seen as political. Uh, if he went forward um, and they lost and he felt that they would lose because there wasn't any hard evidence, mm-hmm. um, he loses. Uh, if he drops a case, you know, it's politics. Right. Uh, so he brought in someone else. Uh, look at the case, you, the, and the special prosecutor, his marching orders was to him at least, he felt, I'm prepared to try the case. Let right. me look at the evidence. And then he ultimately decided? Not to, not to, uh, to drop the case because it wasn't anything, any, there was not enough evidence to uh, convict. And, and to go forward. All right, folks, we're speaking with Maureen Boyle, author of Shallow Graves. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll, we'll take some calls. Yes. All right, great. Good. So we'll be right back, folks. Stick around. I see you, well, the phones are all lit up. So we're going to go to you folks after we take this quick commercial break. And we're back. 
here with Maureen Boyle uh, discussing her book, Shallow Graves, The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. We're, we're going to go to the phones. Folks, listen, be, be respectful of everyone else's time. There's plenty of people who want to talk. So if you, if you can get your question out quick, that would really work best for all of us. Good morning. Thanks for holding your live on WBSM. Hi. Um, I, it's Chris McCarthy, right? Yes. Hi, and Maureen. Hi. My Hi. cousin was Joanne Andrade, my first cousin. Okay. And um, uh, that was like really the beginning of it, I believe. And it was there was a big lapse between her murder and then when it started again. But, but yeah, the, yeah, you're, you're correct on that. Uh, Joanne's death, uh, Joanne's murder, uh, was one of the cases that really did uh, peak up. Uh, John Dextrator's uh, interest because but she was done, she was found different because we yeah. had a closed casket. She was found on the city pier, yes. all all beat up to yeah. a pulp. Yeah, there were there were two two women that were found in that general area. So she was in the water, yeah. and then we had to have a closed casket for her. And then the the family moved out of town because they couldn't deal with yeah. it. But um. What was I going to? I'm interested in reading the book now. How much does the book cost? If and and you're going to do it on September seventh. Yep, you can you can also order it. You can also order it I don't online go on the computer. So I'd be interested in the signing. Okay, oh uh, yeah, that is at it's. Uh, I think it's nine, 1995. I can't find the price. I'm I can't find it either. I think so. We, we have the media copies yeah. here. Well, it's about 20 bucks. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's about 20 bucks. Uh, and it It's w- worth every penny, I will tell you that. I got to ask you something yes. else. A girl named Kitty called me and said that they were making a video that might go to the... Like, yeah, there is, there is a documentary uh, team that's Thanks working on the... Um, on the case also. Yeah. And Th- they're still actively doing that. Thank you for your call. Uh, obviously, we're sorry for your loss. Thanks for holding your live on WBSM. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Mike? Uh, Ma- Maureen, in your investigation, did you ever get to talk to the two girls, Jeannie Kalushis and Abdel Leakes, who said they saw a movie where the, one of the, uh, where a girl was being uh, choked? Well, G- uh, Jeannie has since passed away. Yeah. Um, uh, and and there is, there is uh, but when you, in the book, we do, do detail what uh, women had seen on different videos. Yeah, again, if you pick up the book Shallow Graves, which we have the author Maureen Boyle here in here, she does describe these adult videos, or yeah. they're worse than adult videos, they're not adult yeah. videos, they're yeah, murder they're, videos, allegedly. Allegedly. That the women describe, and, the, and you describe them uh, in I, a way that we can't describe here on the radio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But th- thank you for your call. Uh, good morning. Thank you for holding your live on WBSM with Maureen Boyle. Hey, good morning. Hey, Jay, how uh, are you? Did you ever hear any stories about Lakeville Hospital? Yeah, uh, do you, you mean the... Uh, uh, I knew a person who provided security there at night. Yeah. And one night a trailer truck pulled off the road with his lights out. Mm-hmm. Five minutes later, he put his lights on and took off. In the morning, the state troopers came. They had found the woman's body dumped in the parking lot. It was in, wasn't it in the dumpster of the restaurant next door? Yeah, that, that, yeah. that, that was, that was a, a, a different case, and they had a suspect uh, that was, if I recall, in the greater uh, uh, Brockton area in that case. Well, that was the other, that's the other part of this, is that, there, there, first of all, unfortunately, there are a lot of murders out there. Yeah. And so they aren't all tied together, and then, of course, it causes uh, different avenues of exploration, yeah. right? That, yeah, that, and they have to, they have to look at... Uh, and in, in an area down here where this is... Of a fairly small area, right. uh, and people stay here. So you have a lot of families and a lot of uh, friends that are interrelated, and uh, there's a lot of ties amongst individuals. So it's, sometimes in these cases, you really have to separate, uh, okay, what's coincidence and what is uh, factual evidence. One of the things that I, I think is so endearing about this book is the way you bring to life no pun intended, the, the victims in this story and their family members. who Some of the family members obviously cooperated with you in this, right? Yes, yes, yes. And you know, you know what is uh, very, very sad? In, back in 1988, uh, as opposed to now, uh, there was very, very little um, treatment available mm-hmm. for uh, female addicts. I mean, there was some, but not as a treatment on demand as right. had been advocated by the, the early 1990s. So, yeah. Uh, the families had no place to go if they had someone who was uh, addicted. Uh, there was a lot of embarrassment sure. involved. Uh, so, And then they, there was a lot of guilt with some family members that 
after you know years and years of trying to get someone help you know do they wash their hands of the individual or right. not and they right. tried not to um you know are they enabling are they not enabling so it's and, a, it's, and people have to live their own lives if you know you can't just keep babysitting someone who's yeah, and as bad as it is i, yeah. I mean people yeah, but know. but but yet this is you know someone that they're close to this yeah. is their their you know you talk about one thing where where they were happy. A couple of victims, a couple of mothers or parents, brothers and sisters, would be more ha- would be happy to hear a phone call from jail when they finally yeah. knew the person was at least yeah, because because they're safe. Yeah. They're safe. Uh, they're hopefully getting some type of help. Talk about the the drug world at that point in New Bedford because that that is intertwined in all of this. Yes, um, I, people have to look at the drug world as a business. Uh, those that were dealing and bringing in drugs into the city uh, and elsewhere in the country, they're businessmen. Uh, the ones that are bringing it in, they're not using. They're looking at uh, they're, they're looking at a market, mm-hmm. and they've got different levels of people that they're uh, they're selling. Think of it as the CEO is uh, looking at a, a broader audience. Okay, where can we? Um, get the biggest uh, bang for our our buck you have, you have one um particular bar room in that place because of course a lot of the stuff goes on in bars and yes. things like this but you have one in the whispers pub which was yeah. famous for its own reasons talk a little bit about whispers pub uh whispers pub was under investigation for cocaine dealing at the time um and the obviously the drug task force uh was uh looking at that to see if there were any ties at all to the highway killings uh, because uh, some of the victims were using cocaine. See, uh, did they go there? Uh, did they know anyone who was there? Um, did anyone there mention anything? Because they also had a wiretap on right. on the on the bar, so they were listening. In addition to the drug investigation, to see if anyone mentioned anything about killing someone. And uh, Detective Ferreira, who, uh, am I saying that? Uh, d- uh, Detective Ferreira wasn't was not a member of the drug task force. Right, he was. Uh, working with Marion, Josie, and other uh, members of his department. It was the Bristol County Drug Task Force. Uh, who that was, was doing handled, that? But he would go around to bars, right, and listen, sort of just listen in? Am I, or am I, oh, no, am no, I, no you're, th- you're thinking of Bruce Machado. Bruce I'm sorry, Machado, Detective Machado, right. Detective Machado was, um, a, a, is a very low-key individual, so he would, no one ever noticed. When he, I mean, he's a, ni- a very nice guy. I don't want to say no one ever notices him, but he w- has a way of being able to step back uh, into the background and okay. just listen. And so he would he would go around the area just to yeah. keep his ear to the ground, right? Yes. And yeah. did he and he and he noticed someone wasn't at a regular haunt where they had been yeah. a bartender, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. And that would be um, Marilyn uh, Cardoza Roberts. Uh, she had been a bartender at a bar downtown uh, for a number of years. Her father was a retired New Bedford cop, and he noticed. Well, has anyone ever s- seen her lately? And he reached out to her father to. And ultimately, get, get uh, she she has not been found. Her body has not been found. Because there are two, at least two, two women, right? Two women, uh, Marilyn uh, Cardoza Roberts and Christina Montero. And they were both also related to police officers, right? Oh, uh, or Marilyn's father was a uh, retired cop, and um, Christina's uh, mother's fiance was a Dartmouth cop. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a. Well, there's still a lot lot to be determined, I think. We'll go back to the phones. Thanks for holding your live on WBSM. Hi. Hi. Can I? Hi, Maureen. I've heard very well of you. Oh, thank you. Uh, someone told me that's sitting in my office right now that Mr., what was it, Pina, he had a relationship with... Uh, Someone in the news uh, business. Well, he, was, he was married. He was married to a, uh, a television uh, personality, uh, Sheila Martinez. Uh, she f- was a television host uh, in the Rhode Island market for years and years, yeah, and since, they eventually married. Yeah, and she's since since passed. And she has since uh, died. We'll take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll give you more information here on Shallow Graves and, and how you get, how you can get the book. And good morning. We're back with for a few more minutes with Maureen Boyle, who's the author of Shallow Graves. And I just want to point out to folks why it's important to read this book and why Maureen has the credibility she has. You covered this for the Standard Times yes. on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, from 1988 to 
uh, well, till, until I left. I left there in uh, 98. And then you've come back and re-interviewed a lot yeah. of people in the book. Yes, if yes you, I if did. You, yeah. Now, uh, what's interesting is when I left the Standard Times, I went to the Enterprise of Brockton. And one of the reasons why I chose to work in Brockton is because one of the victims right. is originally from Brockton. And I knew that I could still keep on covering the case. And you have quite a bit about that family in the, in, yes. in the book. Yeah. Um, where can someone get the book? Uh, you can get the book through the publisher, which is uh, University Press of New England, upne.com. You can order order it now from them, uh, Barnes & Noble. You can also order it Barnes & Noble online, um, Amazon, and local bookstores. If you can find a local bookstore. If book you can store, find a local bookstore. I, book I know that the a bookstore in Westport has it. Excellent, which is also where at least one of the bodies was found. Yes. Right. Which has no correlation to the yeah, book and being interesting, released. Interesting. Yeah. None of the bodies were found in New Bedford. You point that out in there that that was one of the things Paul Walsh, District Attorney Paul yeah. Walsh, always thought was very very unusual. Yeah. That all the bodies, while well, the people probably abducted from New Bedford, never buried, never left in New. Never Bedford. left in New Bedford. They're and all what? found along uh, highways circling the city. And what does that possibly mean? You have a book signing coming up. Yes. Um, September seventh, Thursday, September seventh, at the uh, Country Club of New Bedford at four thirty. And people will be able to buy the book there. People will be able to buy the book there. So if you're not internet, if you're not internet savvy or can't wait, yeah, I would say the can't wait department is big, folks. I've read the book. Believe me, I, I'm a for those of you who listen regularly. I'm a, a big reader of books, and I love crime books. We've had Tim White on here, who who wrote a blurb for the back yes, of the book. Yes. A friend of our show here, Tim White from W uh, uh, P R I. Yes, I've I've read his book. It's very good. Very good stuff. He wrote a blurb for this book, so he endorses it as well as I do. I read it. I'm telling you, go out and get it. Shallow Graves. Thank you so much for joining us, Maureen. Uh, really, really impressed with, with your work and uh, in your, the stuff you're also doing at Stonehill. Folks, stick around for the local national news. We'll be back for the next hour as well. Um, here uh, covering... Oh, by the way, if you want to have any questions, uh, Maureen's going to take off, but if you have any uh, questions on how to get the book, you can reach us here at 508-996-0500. And, 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 and also, uh, people can find me on Facebook. Uh, there is a Facebook page for the book. Um, Shallow Graves, um, The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer. Uh, also, there's an author's page for me, uh, and you can message me through the book page. Uh, I'll answer your questions right away. Yeah, it, it really is a, because this has been a, a, a lifelong project for you yeah. in some respects, right? Yes, yes it has. Um, also, if anyone wants to reach me through t Twitter, uh, it's Maureen E. Boyle 1. Uh, you can message me or uh, reach me that way too. Also, folks, we will be. This interview has been recorded, and it will be up on our YouTube site for WBSM as well. So, if you missed a part of it or want to hear it again or share it with a friend, please do. You can go to you, our WBSM page on YouTube, um, and we'll probably have it other places as well. Thanks. We'll be we'll be back for the next hour.